how can you find the shortest path to a given destination? In the first part of this lecture, we discovered Dijkstra's algorithm that solves this problem. But there's more to discover here. In particular, we want to understand what problem-solving strategy is used in this algorithm. Let's see where this takes us. This is the second part of lecture two in the Networks and Complexity course. If you haven't seen the first part yet, check it out, link is in the description. Or maybe up there. The central idea of Dijkstra's algorithm is that the challenge of finding the shortest path to the destination becomes really easy if we first find how far all of the locations in the network are from the starting point. In the first part of this lecture, we implemented Dijkstra's algorithm with pen and paper. And a good way to do this is to construct these nice tables. If you wanted to implement the algorithm actually on a computer, there is a slightly better way to do this. Because on a computer, you don't want to store this whole table in the memory. The information that we really need to store are the current distance estimates of how far each node is from the start. And also, for each node, we want to store where we updated from when we discovered the best paths that we have so far. Finally, we need to keep track of which nodes we have already updated from. But because we do these updates in order of the distance of locations from the starting point, we only need to remember how far the last node we updated was from the start. Then everything that's closer to the start than this distance, we have to update it from already, while everything that's farther away still needs updating. What this means is we only have to remember the number of the last nodes that we became sure about. With these variables defined, we can then implement the same procedure that we use with pen and paper. This will reveal all the distances to the different locations, and ultimately, we can find the best route. Let's get back to our main question. What is actually the problem-solving strategy that we use in Dijkstra's algorithm? So far, we know brute force approaches and also greedy algorithms. But Dijkstra isn't actually one of them. In a brute force approach, we would try every possible path to the destination. But clearly, that's not what we did when we found our way to Mount Doom. By contrast, in a greedy algorithm, we would only do the best thing in every step. There's actually a little bit of a greedy algorithm in Dijkstra, but it's only the very final step where we have calculated the distances to all places already, and then we just backtrack to find the actual path to the final destination. Before that, we have the rest of the process where we compute the distances, and that is not a greedy algorithm, right? Because we produce some intermediate results that are not part of the final solution. For instance, in the first part of the lecture, we found the distance from Hobbiton to Isengard, but Isengard isn't even part of the final solution. So the main part of Dijkstra's algorithm uses a different problem-solving strategy that is known as branch and bound. And to understand branch and bound, it is best to first consider what we would actually do if we tried a brute force solution. So how do we explore all possible paths on a network that might be our optimal solution? It's a bit tricky, isn't it? But we can do it like this. We start at the starting point because we know that all paths that can be the solution must start from there. And from the starting point, we then travel the links, and at every node that we reach, we keep track of all possible options to continue further. So from our starting point, we gradually create a list of all possible paths until they reach the destination, or at least until each path has either reached the destination or has no more hope of reaching it. Let's again consider our example system from part one. In this case, our journey starts at Hobbiton. So in the first step, we have just one solution candidate, which only contains one node. Hobbiton. We can now grow the solution. And by grow, I mean that we consider all the roads that start from the place where we are currently at. If there are multiple such roads, then we consider them all separately. And for each one of them, we attach them to the solution that we have so far. So that will give us now multiple candidates that are the offspring of the one we currently have. In, in Hobbiton, we find a road that takes us to Bray in six days and another one that takes us to Isengard in 49. This gives us two no-candidate solutions, one that puts us in Bray on day six, and one that puts us in Isengard on day 49. 
Now we can discard our initial candidate, the Bosch Hobbiton, because it won't be the ultimate solution. And we have already explored all onwards routes from there. Let's do this again. Let's grow the solution where we are currently in Bray. From Bray, there are three roads. One leads us back to Hobbiton, but we can't even take that because if we appended Hobbiton again, the result wouldn't be a pass. If a walk contains a node twice, it's not actually a pass anymore. Alternatively, we can also go to Isengard from Bray. This takes us 48 days. So that solution candidate puts us on Isengard on day 54. So we could continue like this. We could keep growing solutions until they reach Mount Doom or until they don't have a chance of reaching Mount Doom anymore. Once we have done this to all solution candidates, we are finished and just need to pick the best solution from the bunch we have left. So this isn't even the most stupid way in which we could address this problem with a brute force approach. However, I think you already see the problem with this. If we keep growing our candidate solutions, they can become very, very many. So this won't be a problem in the small network here, but it will become a problem for any reasonably sized network. But maybe we can make this approach a little bit more efficient. Let's look closely at the list of candidate solutions that we have so far. There are two solutions that take us to Isengard, but one takes only 49 days, while the other takes 54. Now we could continue to grow the longer solution, but there's no point, right? There's no chance that growing the longer option will eventually yield an optimal solution. Even if it turned out that we had to go to Isengard on our way to the destination, we would rather use the shorter route than the longer one, wouldn't we? So we can just eliminate the longer of the two solution candidates without a risk that we will miss the eventual solution. And see, this is exactly the idea behind the branch and bound problem solving strategy. Branch and bound algorithms are those where we branch. That means we hedge our bets and keep track of all possible candidate solutions. But at the same time, we are also bound. And that means we take care to eliminate all those solutions that have no hope anymore of becoming the eventual optimal solution. So this is almost like brute force. But at the same time, it is more efficient because we can effectively reduce the number of candidate solutions that we deal with. And of course, this is exactly what we did in Dijkstra's algorithm. The table that we made last time obscures us a little bit. But every time we enter a new number on the table, what we actually do is we branch off a new solution candidate. And every time we override a number, we actually eliminate one of the candidate solutions that we identified earlier. So Dijkstra's algorithm is a branch and bound algorithm. Moreover, by starting from the nodes that are close to the start, Dijkstra's algorithm does the updates in a very efficient way. This order maximizes the opportunity to bound, and this keeps the number of candidate solutions under control and makes the algorithm so efficient. We are starting to assemble a pretty good toolkit of problem solving strategies. When approaching a new problem, the first one you usually want to think of are the greedy algorithms. If a greedy algorithm is possible, then it will usually give you the fastest solution to the problem. The problem with greedy approaches is that you need to understand your problem well enough that you can be sure that you do the best thing in every single step. This is why Dijkstra's algorithm only uses a greedy approach in the last step. Before we can apply it, we need to do some research. We basically need to find all the distances from the start to the various nodes in order to have enough information to make the greedy approach possible. If we don't have enough information to be sure that we do the right thing in every step, a greedy approach might yield non-optimal results. But sometimes we still put up with these non-optimal greedy approaches just because they are so efficient. So we rather get a non-optimal solution fast than an optimal solution after a long time. But what if you want to be sure that you get an optimal result? Well, then there's branch and bound for you, right? In branch and bound, we don't only do the best thing, we do everything. We explore all the solution candidates, except for the ones where we can be sure that they have no chance of becoming the optimal solution. Our success with branch and bound approaches hinges on the ability to bound effectively. If we are not good at ruling out some of the candidate solutions, then the number will just keep growing and growing, making this approach very inefficient. 
to fix this problem, it can be useful to take some liberties and also eliminate those solutions that we think have a low chance of becoming the optimal. This is a problem-solving strategy that is known as branch and cut. Branch and cut is another problem-solving strategy that is not guaranteed to be optimal. But if our intuition about the problem is good, the probability that we miss the optimal solution can be very small. Finally, there are brute force approaches. If your system is small enough, a brute force approach might just be feasible. And consider that brute force approaches are typically the ones that are quickest and easiest to implement. So, while a brute force approach might not be so efficient in terms of computational time, it might be very efficient in terms of your time, human time. And ultimately, that is a much more limited resource. So, this is lecture two done. I hope you enjoyed it. I can already promise you that I will go to quite some lengths for the third one. You might watch it right now, or you may first join me for some exercises and become a shortest pass ninja. Sounds tempting if I put it like this, isn't it? In any case, see you in the next one.